All right, so we're going to go ahead and start off with uh, Dale Graff here. He's going to give his presentation. It's going to be very interesting because those that don't know, he's a former uh, director of the Stargate program, so he was one of them. Yeah. Okay? And from that, in his illustrious career here, he's pu pushed out two books, and I'll bet they're both not covered yet either. And, of course, he's an independent researcher right now. But in all seriousness, a very capable researcher, very credible man, a lot of important things to say, and I'll let him take it over from here. Thank, Thank you. you very much. I appreciate being here. It's my first time to be at an Erber conference. And um, I, I really like making this, this link and closing the loop. Having been involved with viewing research in one way or another for about 17 or 18 years, it's, it's a pleasure to be here. And I really thank the committee for asking me to come here. My, of course, you might uh, oh, back up one. Naturally, I want to start with my title chart. I've got several topics I want to go over. One, I want to put some closure on some of the things that we discussed on the panel here last night and have a few illustrations of the FTD years, the Foreign Technology Division, the Air Force involvement in remote viewing research. Then when I get through that, I'll go into some recent international SI dream experiments. I, I'm from the research community, basically and also the applied world, but my heart is in the research side more than uh, in, the, in the applied at this point in time in my life. And I use the term PSI because it's a research term for parapsychological phenomenon. It's easy to say and um, I just kind of like the term and I realize remote viewing is a common word here. Uh, rem remote, remote viewing would, would be an aspect of PSI. I'll also be talking about a, a new twist at least for me, in the kinds of independent experiments I've been doing over the past decade or so. Actually, I began doing independent research even before that, and I'll cover that. But I've been looking at illusions as targets for remote viewing or psi dream experiments. I'm coming in with some, at least from my point of view, some interesting observations. And of course, I'll talk about a few other things, including uh, the um, what, what do I mean, what do some people mean by the future? And I'll be discussing premonitions toward the end of my talk. So let's go right to the Air Force years. Uh, I already talked about my terminology. I like to be very general on this. And since I'm dealing with side dreams, I created a nice little term because that's sort of the trend these days. And I've created the term DSP for dream state psi. Years ago, DSP meant Defense Satellite Program, but that's another story. And because I like symmetry, I would create the term CSP for Conscious State Psi. That's just a neat little way I keep track of remote viewing, clairvoyance, ESP, telepathy, you name it. It's just the way I keep track of this very type of phenomenology that we are studying. Okay, Air Force years. Talked a little bit about that at the panel. That's between 1976 and 1981 at the Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in Dayton, Ohio. That's where the Foreign Technology Division was located, a division of the Air Force, a part of the Department of Defense. There were two aspects to the, to the activities, to the remote viewing activities at FTD. One, of course, you've been hearing quite a bit about, and that's the Stanford Research Institute support, the remote viewing research at SRI. And the other part, which I'll be uh, going into, what did we do at FTD? Within remote, remote, remote viewing within FTD did exist. Well, the Stanford Research Group, you already heard quite a bit about. I'm not going to go over this in much detail. I mentioned it last night. It began because of a discovering of foreign research, namely that of Professor Kogan, an information theorist. Uh, there was a lot of synchronicity and good timing going on. The paper I wrote uh, about far, the possibility of Soviet developing ESP or remote, uh, they didn't know the, the word remote viewing at the time, so I used the term ESP. Uh, the possibility of that becoming an intelligence collection tool for the Soviet Union is what got FTD into this business in the first place. That was one of the main reasons. And then, of course, the, the uh, briefing team of Hal Putoff and Russ Tard came to FTD in early 1976, and that led to a, a contract. 
And we picked up and tried to improve where we could the previous CIA funded work and expanded that to include a few other objectives that were relevant to the Air Force. Namely, locating missing pilots, prisoners of war, and unfortunately, uh, we didn't hope this would be the case, but hostages. And we also, of course, evaluated, wanted to evaluate the potential of, of remote viewing for intelligence collection of remote sites in the Soviet Union. I was assigned a contract manager, and uh, we did have a terminology debate, but I'm not going to go into that one right here. Uh, we weren't sure what we wanted to call this. Uh, you just can't write a contract and say remote viewing technology or ESP, so we had to create some uh, interesting words to get it through contracts. Now, at FTD, I'm going to focus now on FTD. What did we do at FTD? What did I do? Well, I had several activities, several assignments after the command section realized that there was something to remote viewing. The first task I received was to report on foreign work in the activity. And I published a book, a report while I was there, a technical assessment called Paraphysics Research and Development in Communist Bloc countries, or, uh, Soviet bloc countries. And of course, paraphysics was another word that we thought might be useful at the time. We didn't want to say ESP, uh, we didn't want to say clairvoyance, but paraphysics sounded like it was a nice technical term. So I published a report on that that went into the intelligence cycle. And of course, the main actor in the Soviet work was Kogan, and I'll have quite a bit to say about him a little later too. But the second part of what I was asked to do was to actually investigate remote viewing. Now, I want to make it very clear. This was an unofficial, burn before reading kind of request. The chief scientist asked me after I was assigned a contract monitor to see if I could just find someone in the facility that might be able to replicate the SRI results. After all, FTD is a rather independent activity. They don't want to listen to a contractor, particularly um, people that are making wild claims that remote viewing is real. And if, if, if Hal Putoff and Russ Targ, if, if they mean what they say, that most anybody can do this, then we should be able to find people within our ranks too. But I had a condition. Uh, don't be visible, don't advertise, don't make a wave, don't get into trouble. Okay, so I wasn't sure what to do about that. So anyway, the, the objectives, I developed a protocol in the event I would find people within FTD somehow that had the potential or that actually had demonstrable RV talent, and I figured we'd give them an Air Force twist. Can this person or that person become proficient enough to locate prisoners of war or missing airplanes? I found several people. Uh, they were military, Air Force, captain, lieutenant, and the one surprise was the one, the second one, RS. My abbreviation for Rosemary Smith. I was in my office one evening, um, not quite sure how to locate people, when she just happens to walk in and says, I hear that you're doing some interesting work and there's something called remote viewing. I think I have some talent here. Can I work with you on your project? Just out of the blue. How does she know that this little secret project was going on? So I figured, well, she passed the test. <laughs> she figured it out. <laughs> but somehow, rumor mills you do, do circulate. You know, So I had to accept that there was a little bit of a leak in the system. She was very good. I, I did a few practice sessions with her. I got into her background. Uh, she was from the South. She reminded me very much, because I just got through reading. Russ had just given me a book called Mental Radio and I, by uh, Upton Sinclair. And she reminded me very much of Mary Craig Sinclair. When I showed her the book, she resonated with almost all of the philosophy that Mary Craig had to say. Plus, Rosemary was a, um, also prone to PK. Uh, psychokinetic uh, episodes, whenever she got angry. She was one woman I never wanted to cross. So the first time I did her, I, I ran her through a local beacon person along the style of, of uh, Hal and Russ's protocol out of a group of 10 or so possibilities in the Dayton area. I pulled the, the envelope and said, go to the uh, Dayton Library. Well, there was, of course, the pond, the lake, uh, the racetrack, the tennis court, but this is what came up. So I went down to the Dayton Library and agreed upon time, and we were told to do this after duty. Don't do this during normal working hours. Don't let her supervisor know what she's doing. And that created some problems, too, because he was from a different department. Okay, I'm down here at the library. 
This is a schematic, and I don't have that picture anymore. It's a tall building with long windows, and I'm standing there. And later on, when I looked at her script, she says, uh, I don't know where you are, but this is a very tall, unique-looking modern building with unusual windows. But it's a reasonable description for a beginner. But then, as I'm standing there, and I remembered what Hal told me, you really got to get into this. You've got to feel the environment. So I pushed through the bushes to press my hand on the granite to really, OK, Rosemary, I'm here. And just as I pushed through the bushes, a um, homeless person jumped out of the bushes and came running at me with a bottle and threatened me. And uh, he greatly came charging out of me, at me from the bushes. I guess he was sleeping back in there. And I became very, um, uh, not exactly frightened, because you know, I could have stood my ground, but I backed off and uh, ran into the building. And I looked out a little later, and he was gone. It didn't occur to me that that might be uh, part of the, uh, uh, the experiment for Rosemary. Um, she says, later on, I'm there resting and thinking about where you are. And all of a sudden, a menacing person appears. And he emerges right in front of me, like, it, like it's a 3D image in front of my eyes, uh, threatening me. And she said, I quit the experiment after that. I thought it symbolized something about you. So I had to explain what had happened. Oh, no, you really got the wonderful target, Rosemary. Thank you very much. So with that, uh, I have to call that a, a hit, a uh, success. A uh, little out of focus there. So as I'm going through this process with her, uh, I can, I'm not totally out of this process myself. And anyone that says a psi experimenter is a, aloof and independent, I think is wrong. And I find myself, as I worked with Rosemary, and I worked with people in the community, uh, finding my own intuitive abilities stirring up. So one night I have a, a very in, in, intriguing dream. It repeated several times. And I see a MiG airplane in the dream. A map was given to me in a dream. And I could recognize the region of the world. It was the Kanchatka Peninsula down to Japan. And I repeated several times this MiG airplane. I told my friends in the aircraft section, and I think there's something strange about to happen, because I already had, had several precognitive dreams uh, that were right on track. And uh, three or four days later, this MiG-25 and defected from the Soviet Union and flew to Japan, uh, where our analysts at FTD were flown over there to uh, dismantle the airplane and, as we say in the intelligence business, uh, exploit the aircraft. Well, so the words of that got around. Uh, words about our experiments, Rosemary's and mine, the, uh, the Air Force lieutenants did okay, but they had some work ahead of them. I could see that. It was reasonable, but not good enough for an operational task. So one time, I'm walking down the hall, and somebody grabs me, a, a colonel, a full colonel, and he says, I want to talk to you. We hear rumor that you have somebody you, you call a remote viewer in your, uh, that you work with. Well, I said, how did you know that? But I'm not going to ask you the question. And uh, what do you want to know? He asked me, where? We have a task for you. Tell me where the Soviet bomber is. <laughs> what? OK, we'll take a look to see if we can locate an airplane. We expected to be working in airplane location projects, but not a Soviet bomber. I couldn't figure out why it was of interest in, to FTD. I didn't know of an airplane from the Soviet Union flying around uh, the US. Well, the airplane was not flying around the US. It was flying uh, down south into Africa. So the airplane is missing in Africa. So the task is find the airplane. Because it was a major search party going on that I was then read into, uh, the, the US government, the intelligence community, uh, went into the country somewhat clandestinely because they had a general idea of where the airplane came down. And they wanted to get in there, exploit it, and get out before the locals realized what was going on. This is the way the intelligence community works at times. And we've only got about three or four days left before we have to get out of country. And nobody can find it. Uh, we have the general area where it is within a 200 by 200 mile square zone. But we searched all over. The search team can't find the airplane. Can you help us out? So I said, sure, Rosemary would be happy to do this. <laughs> I got her in the hall a few minutes later. I said, Rosemary, let's go into my cubicle here. Uh, it's about 4.30. You don't have to go home right away. We have a little project for you to work on. 
So I showed her a picture of the, the Soviet airplane and said, it's missing. They did tell me it was in Africa, and I did show her the map of Africa. I'm, I'm sorry, I did not show her a map of Africa, just a picture of the airplane. I said, all right, Rosemary, tell me what you think. Um, we're going to go ahead and see if we can locate, can you come up with indicators through your remote viewing process that might help narrow it down. Um, later on, I worked with Gary Langford at FTD. So as I got into this, this is upside down, sorry about that. When I got into the project, she started making a sketch. And uh, the task was, give me landmarks of where the airplane might be located. She drew a lake, uh, a couple of mountain peaks, and a path where she thought the airplane had gone. You'll have to invent, invert your mind here, which is easy to do after this weekend. Okay, so it ended up um, flying around and going down over in that region. So I, okay, it was a good sketch. I passed it under the search team, not having any idea what was going on, because I had no idea where it was in Africa. I just kept blind to that. And they came out a few minutes later and said, look, this looks like there's something going on. This does fit part of the topography of, of an area, but it's not where we're looking for the airplane. I said, well, maybe that's, this is the area, because if you haven't found it, maybe this is where it is. <laughs> that was logical enough. The next step was to take the, the general schema of going over a lake and there's a little city up there that she thought was there. And it really, it really was a city like that on the map. By the way, I just found that sketch. I didn't know I had it. I just found it as I was preparing for this conference. I'd squirreled it away all these 25 years or whatever it is. All right, so this is, we didn't do this one. I'm doing this to illustrate. So we went to a map and then she looked at another map. This is phase two, where you look at the map and mark it. And uh, this was the path, there was some lakes in there, and it seemed to come between those two big, those two lakes, and the mountains are over in there. But we needed to get more exact than that. So the next step was to see if she could mark it on a topography map, a topographic map. And again, looking at her sketches and the details, she was able, in her mind's eye, to narrow down, as she perceived it, more detail of where that airplane might be, uh, given the, the actual configurations of the hills and mountains, and put a little X in, in there, and uh, that was then circled. This is the region where we think it is. The airplane came up in there and bam. Well, the search team said, ah, we don't know if that's really true because we're 50, 100 miles off in this corner, but we have nothing to lose. So they sent out a request to start looking for it. Uh, some native got hold of the, either the request or somehow understood uh, that there was a search going on and kept looking around. And within two days of when this information got to the field, the airplane was found right uh, where that dot is. And uh, that's about two kilometers from where the airplane crashed. And this blew people away. You know, how could you do this? And um, of course, this was a quiet program. We were not supposed to talk to anybody about this result. The fact that even though it led indirectly to locating the airplane, the fact that the Air Force used psychics to look at an airplane, that was not the kind of visibility our commander wanted. But I wasn't worried because this was a highly classified program. Wrong. Jack Anderson and somebody got hold of this and uh, became a very popular item in the Washington Post. Now, just a little backfill here. Uh, in, 95 year, in 1995, um, I was able to talk about this on uh, the, the uh, Nightline uh, program with, with uh, Ted Koppel, so it sort of closing my history on that. Um, all right, well, what happened? The, uh, the, uh, the, the first thing that happened was that there was a huge knee-jerk reaction. Um, the Air Force Chief of Staff canceled the program. Uh, I went back to my normal technology assessments. Uh, I was involved in a very prestigious uh, sabbatical. In fact, I was scheduled to accept the one, one and a half year leave of absence to go studying in this country in electromagnetic labs, in parapsychology labs, approved by the deputy, by the, by the director of the central, in, uh, the director of the central intelligence agency. A very prestigious award because of this little proposal I wrote about a year before. That was canceled. So I, you know, no longer am I going to go on this wonderful little research trip. And uh, well, okay, I'll go back to doing my other duties. But then the most ironic thing that I could ever imagine happened. I was called into the office. I figured I'm going to get chewed out again. But no, they gave me a new assignment. I am now the Air Force representative in intelligence to try to figure out ways to defeat the MX missile basing, which is one of the reasons why Air Force people thought the program, our remote viewing program, was canceled. 
I had these uh, slides out of order, sorry about that. So anyway, um, the idea of remote viewing, the publicity and visibility we got uh, just didn't really work out and it created a huge uh, reaction in Air Force staff. It canceled everything, everything I was involved in and uh, back to technology assessment. Well, it really didn't bother me too much. And my supervisors thought, how comes after all those losses uh, and the whole agency can no longer touch remote viewing by decree from the chief of staff of the Air Force? How comes you're not in some kind of pit of depression? I was walking around happy as a lion. I said, well, I believe in my dreams. And I had a precognitive dream that this would happen and that I would eventually be reassigned to a higher level agency, the Defense Intelligence Agency. And a few weeks later, I got the offer to come down to join the DIA to take over uh, the external research with SRI to continue liaison with the emerging Fort Meade unit and uh, to, to do uh, other interesting things and uh, follow certain technologies that were very interesting to me. So it really worked out to my advantage. Then, through one very cycle after another, and being connected with the, the Fort Meade unit, um, at, uh, the remote viewing unit at Fort Meade, the external research that we were supporting through the DIA, uh, I was ultimately, or in, in time, uh, some 10 years later, actually transferred into the unit. And around that time, I actually uh, decided, well, we need a new code word. I came up with the, uh, the idea of Stargate. It was a, a two-letter word at the time, but all, all I could spell it as one. It would be a, a good name for this project because it, it symbolized reaching beyond the range of, of human potential. It had a nice feel to it. I didn't have any knowledge that there was a movie being produced at the same time called Stargate. <laughs> and uh, so it was a new integrated program. This is the first time we were able to bring together the uh, the Army activities, because by this time it actually had been transferred to the Defense Intelligence Agency. And uh, we were also able to add not only the external research, but I continued on with uh, evaluating foreign activities in this, at the same time. Now there's a little sidelight here. Right after I created the name Stargate, and this is a you know, secret code word, it burned before reading. Um, I took my wife to um, Shenandoah's because I live close to them and there's some wonderful vacation places back in there uh, for the weekend. So um, this is, and I didn't make any advanced reservations because that's how I like to travel. Be totally spontaneous, try it sometime. It works out. So I get to this place that has all these cabins in the mountain. And uh, okay, my wife says, you're not gonna find a cabin. Yes, I am. So I go in there, there's about 200 possibilities. They only had two left. It's okay, we're in. So the, the one that was on the lake where I really wanted it, I said, that's the one I want. They'll take it. But then I saw the name, Stargate. No, I'm not going to go into this cabin. <laughs> Somebody's going to figure this out. <laughs> that, goes, that, that goes to show how paranoid you can be. Um, sorry about that. OK, sorry. OK. Okay, all right. Is that in focus? All right. Well, there were other things going on. I'm going to skip the, the details in that. So I left then, and you know, years later, I think back to the experience. And uh, well, you know, whenever we have the, a severing of relationships, whether it's a personal or with business, you have to find a way to, to, dat, to detach. So I had a decent mental burial for FTD. And this is my way of saying farewell, FTD, rest in peace or rest in pieces maybe is a better way of putting it. So that was my brief wild tour through the whirlwind of the Air Force technical intelligence uh, involved with remote viewing activities. Now let me shift gears. And I'm gonna go into a, a totally different kind of perspective. But before I get here, I need to give you a little bit of background. Uh, it's out of order, so I'll do that later. Um, let me jump ahead now to this year, uh, to the current, the past couple of years. After I um, retired in 1993, I decided to continue on doing some personal investigations. Um, I was interested in remote viewing to see what I could continue in that arena on my own. 
Uh, but I was also very interested in the dream state, because that's how I got into this in the, really in the first place, through uh, the ability to remember dreams very vividly. And uh, so I continued both, because I have the feeling and that the dream state and the conscious state psi really are kind of co-mingled here. And somebody asked that question the other day, what's the difference? So I had very, a very strong interest in trying to identify what really is the difference? Is, is there an advantage to one and not the other? Uh, what, what's better? Uh, what, what time should we rely on a dream? And what time should we go the conscious state remote viewing uh, a, approach? And I also realized there was another battle here for me to deal with. Remote, uh, dreams have another negative kind of image, at least they did years ago and even to some extent even now. Uh, ESP remote viewing had an image problem back in the early 70s. But dreams, people will say, oh, it was only a dream. So you, you all heard that. And I had been working with people in the community over the years, uh, even before I became involved with um, Hal and Russ, uh, as a dream worker. I, I, was very, I thought I was very good. People kept asking, coming back so I could you know, deal with dreams and not really analyze them, but walk them through the experience. What did it mean from an interpersonal relationship kind of view? In fact, at one time, I was even thinking of becoming a professional counselor inside. I was so interested in the dream world. But then I shifted my attention to what is the potential of the dream for, pre for presenting psi ESP information? Because I had so many premonitions in my life. Why can't we just harness the dream as well as the conscious state? Well, OK, I gave this some thought and decided on a strategy. And again, I'm being influenced by my technology background. Uh, I, at one time for many years, was the chairman in the intelligence community of the Radar and Electro-Optics Data Working Group. Now, that meant I had to look at lots of funny-looking data and they go through a lot of signal processing. So I'm very familiar with information and signal processing. So it occurred to me, I started struggling so hard with trying to do these things consciously. And since premonitions and precognition seems relatively easy for people to experience, why don't I start conditioning myself and saying, OK, subconscious mind. Whatever that is that's going on, you know what's going on. I don't. And I'll just have the idea, the thought. I like to see that remote place or that remote picture and just keep drilling this thought in my mind, assuming that whatever the network connections are, it would eventually happen. In other words, I felt that what I was doing was taking a little aperture and like in signal processing, stretching it out over decades or just stretching it out over, over days. And so that was my approach. Um, let the signal creep in, analyze it, invite it into your consciousness, your dream consciousness, and hope that, hope that the last dream of the night is the picture or the place. And I started working with pictures because they were very easy to control and whatever it is. And I found, to my surprise, that I'd go through this drill. Sometimes I walk around the yard for half a day mowing the lawn. Tonight is a night. Subconscious mind, do your thing. Do your filtering. You know what you're doing. I don't. And that late that night, I wake up from a dream. Typical scenario is I'm looking in an art gallery, and an artist comes in and lumps a picture down in front of me. And I wake up, remember it, and I draw and paint and everything what I see, and it's almost identical to the target picture. So there was something to this. And this is what I then pursued independently on my own. And that's what I want to get into now with some examples. Um, that's, these slides got out of order. I really apologize for that. Oh, good. <laughs> Oh, I'm going backwards. That's what's happened. Hitting the wrong button. No, I'm not. Yeah. Forward. What's going on? All right. Oh, you've got them upside down, even though I tried not to do this. All right. About a, two years ago, I was contacted by a um, Gestalt therapist from Austria, Vienna, Austria. I was at Dean John's lab attending a conference. And she approached me and said, I would like to do some remote viewing long distance experiments. And that is a good thing, a good idea. Why don't we do it? And we set up a protocol where um, we, we do the conscious state remote viewing, then we do the dreams. And we do three in a row, no feedback, with a two day period. 
so that we have enough time to cycle and recycle. And when we finish with our three in a row, we document everything. I had my data notarized, notary public. It cost me two bucks and a half every time I did this. And then we exchanged all this stuff by internet. And the objective was, after, after all this is, is exchanged, we ship the pictures, the three pictures, in random order to one another. Can we choose it? Well, here's some examples. Yeah, what happened there? Oh, OK. Oh, that's a logical explanation. I thought it was PK. OK, so the first series that I, I did with her, this is, she's 6,000 miles away. Now, I'm going to talk about this slide a minute. This is one of my favorites for beginners. Now, I've been criticized by this slide, because somebody will look at this and say, oh, that's too complex, there's too much information in it, or anybody will guess most anything, you'll find it there. No, look at it from an information processing point of view. Look at the redundancies in there. And then you want to go out and look at that courtyard out here. <laughs> it looks very similar to the courtyard you're going to look at. But look at all those shapes, there's so many similarities that even with weak, a weak connection, it's the picture end is going to amplify it. This is my model. I do not agree with the statement that the picture has nothing to do with it or that it's all in the mind. I, I have seen enough evidence to think you've got to look at two aspects. How you detect and sense what that picture is, whether it's remote viewing, side dreaming, or what, and what you do in your mind when it gets there. So I'm open to the two problem issue at the end sensing it and at the mind processing it. And that was a very strong picture. This is the first time she's ever done this, even though she works with, uh, in closely, with, intimately with people in her practice. And I'm only summarizing the key things. A lot of stuff had to do with clinical work that I, there's no point showing because we knew it had no application here. And she thinks she's in a hotel. You can read what it says there. Looking down, she interpreted the um, checkerboard as a typewriter with uh, white keys and stuff like that. I did another one with her. This is a standard. I don't like to brag about this because people will say, you can guess Niagara Falls anytime. But, but I look at the specifics. Uh, I have other falls in my target pool, not just Niagara Falls. And um, she had a very good hit here. It's a landscape, here water falling, and talked about um, something like a gray uh, statues rising up. So these two practice sessions make me think, OK, this woman really can do something. And we'll move on with our formal series. Uh, Okay, I appreciate that. I really thought I, uh, I got these straight. Best plans go awry. All right. So here's just two more examples of what she did. Uh, the one up there, I like to use people, living things, not just structures. And, and you've got to remember who you're working with. She's a very emphatic, uh, a lot of empathy feeling. She works with gestalt therapy. And she likes to relate to people. And then this picture here, she caught almost immediately and kept seeing these faces and these pictures of, uh, in her mind's eye when she did the session. The picture down there, uh, she came in with the structures. It was fairly decent, I thought. Um, the castle, the architect, the architecture, describing it as a ramped up apartments, that sort of thing. So these kinds of things allowed her to choose the right picture out of the three that we had. And then, of course, the second one and the third one, because we're doing this in the sort of a, you get the three, try to arrange them in the right order. Um, I also took my shots at this. Can that be focused better? Now, these are the two practice shots. That's her picture. This is the first time I didn't draw anything for a while, because I wasn't sure how to do this. And my impression's in a relaxed state where I'm looking at a theater with all kinds of billowing curtains, 6,000 miles away. And then in a dream state, because I'm doing two together, I'm in a little platform diving into a large lake. So I'm now play acting the situation. Uh, and the one below, you wouldn't, this is not everybody's choice for a target in a target pool. Uh, a very hard target. And I couldn't get anything in the conscious awake state. So I went to the dream state. And nothing happened until late that night. And here in this dream, very simple. Car comes in, gets up in a rack, and I look at the muffler, and it's huffing and puffing and hissing. Okay, in this dream, the car is a non-issue. It's a carrier vehicle. I just throw that out. That's background noise. So I drew the muffler. Okay, that's the painting. You know, it has that sort of hissing, bumbling stuff going on. Um, and when, when I do dream work, I strip out the personal stuff, and particularly when I'm looking at psi dreams. Because that's just noise. We know how to handle that in, in dream work. You know, this is a personal thing. Don't leave Antilly running around all the time. Get rid of her. You see what Antilly is carrying. 
That's the important thing. Well, sorry about that. Now we go to the, the first longer distance one. She's in Greece for, three, for a couple of weeks, running a program in creative dreaming. So we set up to do experiments between Maryland and Greece. My turn. Um, the two-night window. I'm not, no way to communicate with her for three weeks because she's on the road up to Turkey and all over the place. Um, the first night, uh, and again, it's a nine-hour time difference. The first night, I got nothing, total blank. This is the, most, the first time I really blew an experiment. I got really disgusted with myself, particularly after those other two. The second night, I end up with a very brief dream, and that's my signature for a side dream. Boom. My side dreams only last about three to four seconds. They're over, in and out, bow. And I can remember this stuff because it's so vivid in my mind. This is what it was. I saw this woman jump up on a stage and come in with the most traumatic dance routine I've ever seen. She spins and swirls and looks up in the air and waves her arms around and her long hair goes swirling. And then other dancers come on the stage. It's full of dancers. I only drew a few. Well, wow, what happened? And I felt so energetic when I woke up. I should have recognized this. I didn't. This is the target. Rolling dervishes. She is focusing on whirling dervishes and the energy that that imparts in, in her mental space. And not only did I sense the, the yellow dress, I, I, I made it a woman, I, you know, I didn't, don't like to look at men dancing, I guess. And the long white beard, the long black beard and her long hair, everything is swirling around like this. So, okay, that, I'm very happy with that. It's a person, or, and I had this notarized, and I took a, about half a morning to draw this, to get it right. That's a little more, another comparison. I gave her no constraints on what the targets were. In the past, I've regretted that because sometimes you get some really tough targets. But I've learned this much. No target is bad. I don't care if it's a dot on a white piece of paper or Yosemite. And it, those are all great targets. You learn something from them, every one of them, no matter how difficult or how lousy they look. In size space, they're wonderful targets. And this is one of them that came up next that she had from um, Greece. Again, this is before I know ground truth. Now, this series occurred in a very different way. And you have to remember my background is optics. And I used to play around a long time ago with zoom lenses. And the two dreams, the one dream showed up and they're side by side, pow, pow. It's like I'm looking at slides. Boom, boom. That didn't quite line up. And then an expansion. I also have what I call zoom in dreams. If there's a, if something coming along here in the dream, which is almost semi-lucid, it, it's like I zoom in on it, and then that's what happened here. I zoomed in on a strip, strip up there, but it was all full of incredibly strange, small shapes. I couldn't put a handle on it, but I drew the dynamics. A river came rolling around. There were shapes in there. I did not call fish. I was very tempted, but I didn't do that, and something stretched over. But there was a hole. Notice that white area. There's nothing there. Now, that's my clue that I missed something. I need to go back. I need to go back and re-incubate the dream. That's the dream worker's term for having another dream with a certain objective. I now desire, it's now like 4 a.m., I now desire to find out what's missing. The dream pops up almost a half hour later, and uh, that's, again, upside down. I really thought I had this right. Um, and here, I'm now looking at what looks like somebody being pulled out of the water. Some strange, distorted figure is being pulled out of the water with a large, fat head. Uh, I thought somebody was pulling there, but it, I wasn't sure, but I drew it. And that's from a zoom in. I figured that's the missing piece. That belongs in the other picture, in that, in that white area. I normally superimpose them. I didn't do it this time. Here's the picture. A sea turtle. Now look at the dynamics, the crazy white color and the dynamics, all the little pieces. And here's what happened. I could not identify it, but I went to another mode of perception, and that is break it to pieces and start over, and go to the very smallest, smallest, smallest piece that is possible and reassemble it. And that's what I think I, what happened here. It, it's all full of just little dots, and at 6,000 miles in this dream, I was able to see those little dots. Then I had to reassemble them and be careful not to call them something, just draw them. Thanks to Ingo and Hal, as I did that in the dream, dream saw, dream RV. 
Okay, putting them together, you can see the, the colors are right on, you know, basically. I didn't have a color pen close enough, but you can, see, you can see what's happening. I didn't put it all together, but I had no trouble choosing. This is the target picture. Another tough one from Greece. Now, this is a different dynamics, and that's every experiment I do is so different, it's, it's really exciting. Everything, everything is, a, and I've done thousands of these since 1971. They're exciting things to do. This one, there were seven dreams that night. Now, when that happens, I know this is a tough target. It doesn't hang together, it's not integrated well. The picture is fragmented. So, in this case, I just drew where I thought the dream ended. You know, if, if somebody's up there in the dream, that's where I put it on my composite paper. If somebody's down there, that's where I put it, and then put it all together. I don't have a long script, I don't write a lot, I just draw one page, that's it. And then look at the picture. I thought it was a circus, but I, mean, I know better than to call it a circus. So I just said, there's a lot of strange figures in here that are hard to see. That was my bottom line conclusion, but it's full of people, hard to see. Well, it's full of people that are hard to see. I heard, an earlier dream had water, but I threw it away. I didn't include that. And it's a tragedy seen uh, on some Greek beach. And if you look at those little figures, I had to blow this up in a magnifying glass to see that those shapes were about the same angle and orientation as what came out in the dream. So, the, you know, this is pretty tiny stuff. Now this one, now this one upset me. Whenever I run into a black and white dream, I, I get frustrated. There's something wrong here. Remember, um, budget has absolutely no constraints on what you can do. Which, which I, I now see was a, a, a very wonderful piece of non-advice. Do whatever you want. The whole night went through, and I just had this. I couldn't get out of this black and white. I felt it was a railroad, but no. Nah, just, just lots of squares and forms, and, and so I superimposed them together on that first night. Not a very uh, good feeling dream. So the second night, I'm well, that's still not sure what to do, and this is my fallback option. I decided to go to my strategy number two. When I can't figure out the picture, and since there is a target observer, I go to mode two. I believe in telepathy. I believe in direct mind-to-mind -mind contact. I've seen it too many times in my life. Now I refocus the dream. Bridget, wherever you are in science space, you know what this is. I desire your knowledge. I've already messed around with the configurations. I'm going to go to the knowledge that you have. I don't care what you're, in what way it's presented to me. I, as long as I get the meaning out of it from you, I don't know where else to go. That's my strategy. This dream came. Again, it's brief, late at night. So these are my signatures. I'm in my hometown. You know, standard beginning of a dream. And I walk to an old hotel that closed down years ago. I'm looking at the old hotel, and it had a basement entrance. I walk to the basement entrance, look down the steps at a door. I hear German-speaking people walk by, but I don't see them. I understand German. In German, I hear them say, we're going to our boarding school. So that's what I recorded. It's a boarding school, a German boarding school. That's what it is. It was the entrance to a German boarding school. But I couldn't get it from the configurations. I had to go to my other mode, because I believe in telepathy. I like that word. I'm not going to throw it away. It's real. The only problem is we have to define where the mind is. Oops. Forward. Oh, that was just a composite. This is a recent one. This was easy. This was her target picture. You might say, that's a lousy target picture, but I love it. It's got that red splot, it's got that white car, and a funny thing up there. Okay, in the first dream, I cannot get a car parked, a white car. Now, the reason it's easy, I have a white car. And another reason it's easy, many years ago, I had trouble parking in a certain angle parking lot. So all this memory came in and matched the target. It's a white car, got it a little bit off an angle. And then I looked up in the sky, where this was being parked, because there was no roof on the garage, and I saw this bar up there. I just drew it, I didn't know where it went. But there is kind of a line up there. So the drawing matches this fairly well. I had no trouble selecting the right target. None at all. This one I did. I struggled with this one. The, uh, it came in pieces, and when that happens, I'm suspicious. 
The first thing was a little child walks across and leaves footprints in the rug. So I draw the footprints, little shades, and I draw the child. Um, I thought there might have been an animal there, but I wasn't sure. And then there's a, a, a most amazing thing in the dream. I'm looking at a wad or a mound of what I considered in the dream even to be gravel, and there was something strange in the gravel. I, that was the only color I had that came close to gravel. So I painted it later on a little table, and there's a pile of gravel in there. And when I'm in a dream, and I'm looking at the gravel pile, the little pebbles in there, it starts rotating. It's full of tiny vortexes. I even hear the fan or the drill that's spinning it. Then it spills over and falls on the ground, and people run in and put them in their hands and carry it around. And then there's another spot in there where there's a little bullseye right in the center of the picture. So I drew that. For me, I have a very easy time with bullseyes, spirals. Those are easy. So when I got the bullseye, I figured, well, there's something circular with the center in it. And it may not be a bullseye. I don't know what the picture is. I didn't have another night to work on it. Okay. At first glance, it doesn't look like the picture, but there's a child, you can't see the footprints down there, and if you look at what they're holding, they're grapes, but they have that bullseye effect. The hair, if you look at the hair, it has that vortex spinning, turning feeling. So I stayed with the configurations, I turned it into what I could understand in my subconscious mind, that what this might be like, and I turned the hair into a pile of gravel, and the dynamics, the shapes of the curls suggested a vortex and a spinning and I turned that into a gyrating, falling mass. I never did see the woman's face, but I did know there was a child running around in there. See a little better there. Ah, okay, this is raw notes. This is why this stuff looks like before I go and spend a couple of hours putting it on a piece of paper, writing it out, getting it notarized. That's all I do. One piece of paper with annotations. That's it. That's my input to all these. This happened on the night of September 11th. This, we had set this experiment up two weeks before. September 11th, 2001. We were all in a state of angst, me particularly, because I lost a dear friend in the Pentagon. I didn't know that then. Um, so I decided I'm going to do the experiment even though I don't feel like it. See what happens. And this is a series of dreams that came out. I normally convert this to something you can understand. There's like another bullseye over here. You can't quite see. Oh, it's upside down. It's over there. And then there's an incredible shaft, like a harpoon, came flying out and hit over there. Another dream was a scenario with a huge fish that got away. And a real struggle with a sea monster, a fish. Although they, they did uh, catch one somewhere. It's, it's, uh, okay, we'll go on. Yeah, I see, you can see my little fish up there. But there was a fish that got away in the dream. This picture, it's upside down. No, it isn't. No, it isn't. Okay, this is a hard picture. There's a bullseye. There is a sea serpent. There's a guy up there that looks like he's a harpoon. And the energy of this curling thing with a hook on it looks like a harpoon. And it curls around something. I just turned that into a cable. But the whole dynamics was there. I had no interference whatsoever from the angst of the day. So I was very happy about this result. Well, Bridget has surprises, uh, I've been finding out. You never know what she's going to do. So here's a time when I'm struggling, just trying to remember this dream, going through my protocol of dream recall. Only the dream, nothing else, and nothing else, just the elements that relate to the target. I go through that. I beat myself against the wall to get that through my head. This time, I'm, I wake up nothing, wake up nothing. It's about 4 a.m. I get up, I go to the bathroom, I step in the hopper, and I wash my feet. Something's wrong with this picture. A false awakening. I had a lucid dream. Okay. Well, I better get back to bed. Who in their right mind would want to go into the bathroom, step in the hopper, and wash their feet? Okay. Well, that's one of those anomalies. Well, it wasn't. This is a target picture. There's a child in a bowl washing her feet. Here, I think, I bypassed the configurations totally and went right to what Bridget knew. Remember, my model includes both modes. What's on the paper pure remote viewing, which in the mind, telepathy. Well, this was a new one, and this is a very disturbing one. Um, all I saw was a face that looked like the head was gone, squashed, ugh, ugly. 
That's all I had for most of the night. So I said, well, I don't like that. There's only one input. There's got to be more to her picture than that. I'm, I'm going to now go downstairs and go to my backup mode. Because I, was, I hadn't done all of this in the remote viewing mode because of time pressures. Um, other things I was doing. So I went downstairs at 4 a.m., got in my comfortable chair, and said, okay, this is now remote viewing time of the picture. And when I got there, the um, thing wrapped around, and all I saw was a blanket around somebody. And the blanket suggested to me that somebody was hiding. And when I went back there, I had another dream with just a face, I gave up. And that was the target picture. There was a part of a play that they were running at the time on uh, Arabic Nights that had a real mystery theme. So, and just a few more quick ones. I also used paper, pages out of National Ge uh, out of Smith Sm uh, Smithsonian Magazine. And they're, they're wonderful. Smithsonian is a great place to get target pool pictures. And this is one some years ago. I just want to show this. I end up in a dream of being in the middle of a crowd. And uh, I look up and I see a politician delivering a really wonderful speech. It was, it was inspiring. Except, as I'm watching in the dream, a figure dressed in black jumps up on a stage and, and stabs him. See that waving hand? There's a figure jumps up and stabs him. And when that happened, I was, to what happened, we're just on the reverse side of the picture. So now we have a situation where the reverse side of the picture came through. And it was flip-flopped. So in the dream, the, the sword actually was pointing in a direction as if I was holding it up to the light and looking at it. So I, have, I call this image overlay, IOL, because the image bled through from the other side of the page. And I incorporated that into the dream image. One more here, and then I'll leave this section. This was another one from the um, Smithsonian Magazine. In this case, the dream was so vivid, I ended up actually playing cards. And I looked at, I looked at the, car, the cards. I walked up to a table. The player's there. I know it's bridge. I recognize it. I look down, and I see two aces. I'm trying to arrange the aces. You have to look at a magnifying glass to see that those are two aces. In the text, it says these are French people playing bridge in a bunker in the marginal line. Talk about illusions. About a year and a half ago, I got this idea. I got a whole stack of illusions I like to work with. And uh, I hadn't used them for a while. So I started working with them. And uh, they were on a, a deck of playing cards. And there were 52 different illusions on, on two decks. Plus, I had accumulated illusions from other sources over the years. So I had a large target pool of illusions. So I thought I'd try that with the idea that there may be some in indication from how the subconscious mind accesses an illusion that might give us some clue into the internal processing in the brain. Do we see it like, we see, like the eye sees it? Or is there a different thing? Are we, is, a, is a side dreamer or a remote viewer going to be fooled or not? Are we going to be fooled in the same way or in a different way? I've only done about a dozen of these, but I just want to show a few of the results. Okay. Well, first, think of illusions. Here's one when you look at it, yeah, it's a pretty grumpy person. But you need, you need to turn grumpy people around, and they become peachy. So it depends on the orientation that we look at a picture. And I'm dealing with pictorial targets. If you look at it sideways, if you're like me, your mind goes into a cognitive dissonance. And you're torn left, right, left, right, left, right. You know, I get dizzy when I look at this. I can't decide which way the face looks. So that's sort of an illusion. I uh, didn't use this one, but I'm thinking about doing it. Okay, the first card that we used, the first card that came out, a blind, I have no idea, this is a double blind. And when I do illusions, or I knew in, in advance these are black and whites, so I'm really tipped off. There's going to be no color, but if there's color in a dream, I'll accept it. Um, and my protocol is, I'll only go for the, this is, this is the conscious state. I'll only go for the first few images. I'm going to cut off because then I'm going to start embellishing. So here I am relaxed in my study, and after about 30 minutes, all of a sudden, I just see that, that notes show up on the top. Well, I, that's all I drew. Okay, I've got some notes. Okay, that's it. I went to the dream state to see if there's anything more there. 
and I saw these strange looking cut forms move across the screen. I thought they were dolls or mummies. I drew them. I didn't really want to analyze them. Okay, I couldn't tell from this what an illusion was, if, if any here. I just didn't know. I may have been off track. Which man is the tallest? Okay, there are three cartoon figures here. And, you, and if you look at the total gestalt, you think that the one in the back is the tallest. But if you strip out the back lines, you can't tell that. Now the heads, I think, I sensed as notes and put them on part of the illusion and just put the notes on like a, a, a music sheet thing. But then later on, I got back to the figures and tried to determine what they were. And since they weren't real, I just really couldn't go very far. They were like cut up figures. So in this sense, the illusion, I did, I did not fall for the illusion because I broke it down into pieces and that destroyed the illusion. What do you see, a duck or a rabbit? Now see, we probably have a mixed call. One sees a, some see a duck, some see a rabbit. Okay, I did this with several people, and the, the consensus was of several people I worked on this double blind, because um, I didn't know what it was until after I'd worked on it myself a few nights later. The, the people tended to get discs and eyes. And that was as far as they could go. Um, I had a dream uh, which had a rabbit, and it was so vivid and so clear. I was absolutely sure this was not part of the illusion because the illusion is forms that don't even look like a rabbit. So, but I drew it anyway. I drew the rabbit because uh, I draw everything I see, uh, unless it's personal stuff. I, I know that's an orange. The rabbit in the dream jumps out and goes into Earth orbit. That's a pretty strange dream. It was a heck of a hop. <laughs> okay, well, what's the target? Uh, well, you saw the target picture, that was the, the rabbit uh, interpretation came up. But why did the rabbit go in, why did I have such a vivid picture of the rabbit? Why did it go into orbit? Look at the word, rabbit. Okay, rabbit and orbit are very similar words. Now I saw what was happening. In addition to accessing the pictorial content, I'm also accessing the words and reading the words. Only in this case, I misread it and made it orbit. So I couldn't decide whether it was a rabbit or an orbit, and the dream put them both together. Ah. What are you seeing? This is a double blind uh, sketch that an artist friend of mine gave me. It's double blind. I've never seen this before. What, what do you see? It's not a good target, but let's talk about it. Well, if you look at it that way, you see something. If you look this way, you'll see something else, okay? And you can see a figure embedded in there. Okay, well, um, one of the people I was working with, again, double blind, because I hadn't seen the target yet, drew this configuration, which begins to resemble the, uh, the lines up there, and just turn it into uh, more of a building nature. The, uh, when I worked on it, I got the idea of somebody laying on a wooden deck of some kind, just laying there with funny trees up there. So I, I got into the, the form of the female figure and, and tried to figure out what that was. So if we didn't know that this was black or white, both these impressions were black and white. So that part tracked the uh, kind of content of the illusion. What do you think of this one? This is another illusion. I tried that and there's several people I've had working on this. I haven't worked on this one myself. Either one or the other. One, one woman uh, thought that she was looking at satellites in a blue sky or, or objects rolling around in the sky that are blue. Another one saw the, the brown curving lines and called it a bridge. The, the two didn't come together, but they were perceiving different aspects of the illusion. What do you see? Take a few seconds to look at it. See anything? It's one of those 3D illusions. There's an embedded figure in there. All right, okay, I would, I would like to have the person uh, just mention what happened. Uh, she happens to be here, that worked from, on this project from Orlando, Florida, a thousand miles away. Patty, could you just mention your experience? I worked with Patty, she's a, an associate of mine. 
just Okay. Okay. Yeah. This is Patty Cyrus from Orlando, Florida. Um, this was a, a, a well, number one, Dale always stretches me with different targets. We've been working on the uh, regular conscious state targets, and he's been trying to encourage me to do dream state targets. So this was uh, one of the first ones, or I mean, the third ones that I've done. And um, in this, uh, you know, I gave myself the command to. Uh, remember the two targets uh, this particular uh, whatever it would be with the coordinates that they gave the guide number. And uh, when I went into the dream state it was similar as uh, going into the conscious state uh, remote viewing in as much as there was a backlight of color but when I got to the target I don't know if you've seen the, the Robin Williams movie when dreams may come or what dreams may come where you feel like you're immersed in this colorful uh, landscape I felt as though I was walking from room to room. And I, when I got to about the fourth room, and each room was distinct and it's uh, totally color saturated with a unique color. And I got to about the fourth room, and I, the room appeared to be like a, uh, like a tiger pulp, and it was stretched <coughs> on all four corners from the floor and the ceiling. And as I walked into the room, I sensed a presence, and then the presence kind of came up to meet me and all of a sudden became like a tiger man. Okay, thank you, Patty. The key words here were emerging from the wall and then re-emerging. And Patty right now has not been able to see the illusion. Uh, but when you stare at it, you see it pop out. It is an animal. That it's, a, it's a lamb, but because it's colored, it does resemble uh, that type, type size animal. So she was able to perceive the animal in his illusion, even with the right dynamics popping out of the picture, going back into the picture, and still can't see it. Well, how much time do I have? Okay, I'm going to skip through this a little faster. One of my favorite topics, phenomenon in Psi, is precognition. Um, I've always been, for a long time, in prone to precognition. Um, starting with dreams back in the 70s, when I lost a lot of weight on a canoe trip, 25 pounds in 10 days. And when that happened, I found that I was able to enter um, dreams directly from being awake. So I was able to lucid dream very vividly from that point on. Uh, I also found that precognition is very common. I can experience a lot of precognitions if I put my mind to it and say, yes, I'm a, this is the kind of dream I want to experience tonight. I want to be open to the future, whatever that future is. Uh, one example, uh, forget, I'll already, said, I'll already said that in words, except I'll, I'll say this, you don't have to turn that around. Well, okay. I, I have a different model in my mind of precognition than what most people have, I think. Um, I'm probably showing a physics bias here. I think it's a physics bias, where I kind of perceive um, the mind space out there as, as assembling lots of probabilities, and that through our psychic abilities, remote viewing or side dreaming, we, we get warnings. We can get four warnings of the probabilities, but that's what they are. They're just probabilities. So I, because of the terror situation, there's a lot of attention on this, and my model in my mind is that one of the main inputs to what a precognitive dream is, is that, that you and I are sensing the intentions that exist right now in somebody's mind, and we're sensing that through a telepathic model. Um, like I said before, I hold very strong to that, that modeling. I think it's a very real phenomenon. And so if somebody intends to do you ill, uh, and then you have that dream about it, and I've had those dreams, where is it coming from? If somebody says in their minds, I'm going to get that person to do something. So it's, it's an intention. There are other ways of looking at precognition. Are we subconsciously sensing patterns, trends, cycles? Well, maybe we're doing that. And it may be, certainly be something else. I'm not saying this is the only way to look at precognition. 
but it's the way I have experienced most of my precognitions. I can trace it pretty much to an intention in somebody's mind. And that might be my bias, but I'm just saying where I'm coming from. Now, one of the first ones that I had in the Dayton, Ohio area, when I first started looking into precognition, I, I dreamt of the neighbor's house. It was a green house, the only one in the whole area that had a green siding. And uh, it all of a sudden, the walls disappeared and, and there's nothing in it. In a very odd dream. Uh, I didn't know what to do with it, but two nights later, burglars broke into that very house and emptied all the furniture out of the front room. I, uh, about a year ago, got the idea that I wanted to do something on a precognitive thing which is larger than just me looking at it. It's interesting for personal things, but I'm going to do a little bit more than that. And I'm an active member of the ASD, the Association of the Study of Dreams. And I gave a presentation in Santa Cruz last year on precognition and precognitive dreams. And I thought, well, maybe I would try to set up a, um, an, an international or whatever Psy Alert Center. It was just a, a toying in my mind that I'm going to do this. And I wrote out some concepts to this and um, thought about it. And, and about the end of August, I, wanted, I decided I'm going to move ahead with this and put it on my web page. So around the end of August, my mind was on precognitive dreams. Let me go one more. Okay. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. On the 31st of August, 2001, I had one of the most disturbing dreams I've had ever. It's a mythological motive. And to summarize, in the dream, I, I see the terribly menacing forms, the threatening. They're like some prehistoric monster flying through the air and shooting balls of fire into tall buildings. Okay. That was the end of the dream. Then I realized afterwards, this is a mythological dream. It's symbolic. Now, what I do when I run into that, which isn't too often, I go back and incubate, and that's our term in dream work, a follow-up. Okay, I don't know what this is. Is this is it something about my impending illness or health or whatever? Uh, what does it mean? More specifics. So the two nights later, in the dream, I see an airplane crash, and it's a tall, a tall modern building, and the whole site is destroyed. Everything's gone. Uh, somebody had given me in that dream six pictures, and I look at them and I see different scenes of the particular crash site. Uh, another dream occurred a couple of nights later, and still in my mind, but very troubling, where I, I see a six-sided building, one side collapses, an airplane comes by. I think I had the order reversed in the dream. And then a couple of nights later, the thing starts repeating, the same repeating theme. Airplanes coming in, people trying to get to an exit, running, screaming. Uh, it was a terrible. I couldn't get these repeating dreams out of my dream cycle. So I finally decided I, I, don't, I can't stand this anymore. You know, it's very disturbing. I don't know what it means. And I just quit dreaming for a while. It reminded me of this famous painting by Ernest Mach, The Scream. This is sort of the, the way that the dreams were beginning to affect me. And it was a very disturbing period. Uh, of course, September 11, and I knew what happened. Here's a kind of a composite of 30 years' worth of looking at this stuff. I'm very interested in is, what is the process? Is, can we do something even symbolically to come close to understanding how Psy works? And I've had a lot of dreams when I really focus on that. And they end up with these incredibly beautiful structures that just boom, go off to infinity. And I interpret that as like sheldrakes, morph, morph, morphic fields, uh, forms uh, that he has postulated. I didn't know about that until 10 years later. So symbolic that there really is this form structure in embedded somewhere in the fabric of, uni of the universe. I'll underline what Sheldrake says. But in addition to these dreams, I get all these things too. The building blocks of the dream figures that eventually emerge, and sometimes it's preceded by the whirling, swirling energies, the spinning lights. There's something in here that is a curl of the vector. There's a rotation and spinning that somehow connects with whatever it is we need to go to access the the distant target, wherever it is. But down below, when nothing gets matched very easily, and there's things in there kind of remind me of cave art, by the way. Uh, down in there uh, are the bits and pieces that exist. What is color? Can somebody tell me what color is? 
So there's these bits out there, and somehow these have then assembled. Whatever the color is, are pulled together as little bits. And then if we don't know what this thing is, or somehow our subconscious mind finds out the right kind of bits and reassembles them, you're given enough time to string them out, and it out pops in your dream or your awake consciousness that image that correlates to out there. Well, here's where I am. Remember, I'm talking mainly about pictures. I wanted to simplify my world, not the real world, not what remote viewers like to look at, but pictures, three by fives, seven by elevens, whatever. That's my world that I want to look at for this series of experiments. And I've been doing this almost since the mid-1970s. And I really do think that right now, the, the, what's going on, we are really getting to the picture, the actual picture. And there's something that happens that can be, extend consciousness to reach that picture. It's not represented anywhere else. It's out there in that space where the picture is. We get it two ways, clairvoyantly or remote viewing-like to the picture, or through what the target observer is looking at. And I think there's several ways, two ways that I've seen with people I worked with and uh, my, myself. It's almost like the two approaches here. One is where we're reporting on something as a detached observer. We observe and report on it. And the other is a rapport, where we have a feeling connection and, and linked to something called feeling and emotion. And I think these are so independently different, and we can bring them together. And, and if we're really operating at an efficient psi level, I think we're kind of in the middle where we're mixing this rapport report. The, the, the origin of the words, by the way, are essentially identical to bring back and to carry back. Just a simplified way of looking at it. And I look at, I hate these charts because they confuse people and confuse me. Uh, mind isn't this simple, but I do think we have other pathways that get into the cognitive place in, people, in our brains where information can reside, not just out in the, in the space. Again, I haven't, I haven't defined what mind is, and I'm not going to. In terms of what is this, there is a side connection. And it's something we know, it's non-local, you've heard that throughout the whole conference. <laughs> no, it's space-time independent. And it is kind of like a hologram. But I also think there's something filament-like here. I have the sense that something is being spun, polarized, uh, pathways. You know, we may be looking at micro, 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 micro spaces that the brain, mind, can somehow find. And when it finds that zip, go anywhere. And of course, I think string theory might be on the horizon to help explain what's going on. That's another topic. Yeah, sure, multidimensional. What isn't? No, I don't need that. I have lots of questions. Lots of questions. But I'm, I have more questions now than I did 30 years ago. But, you know, they're, they're good questions. I still don't know this, the question that I asked Hal Putoff back in 1976. Where is the target? What is psi? Um, I don't know. But I, I do think there's, you know, as more and more people put their attention to this, uh, we understand what consciousness is, I think, and what it is not. What psi is and what psi is not. Maybe we'll make some progress. And my biggest question, and this is one I realized is a real one back in the 1970 even, was why is there psi? Why? It doesn't make any sense from a survival point of view that psi uh, exists. You know, you can think of the Aborigines or the you know, Algonquins using their dream state or the dream time or whatever intuitive in, in, in impulses to locate the, uh, the herd around the hill or the, the Eskimo fishermen to find the seal. You know, that's survival, but you're not going very far. How far can you walk? But what good does it do? to be able to describe a scene 10,000 miles away. What's the survival value of that? I don't understand that. It doesn't make any sense. So from a communication information point of view, it's a very fascinating thing to, to ponder. Why is there a sign? And I know people that are coming from metaphysical dimensions or spiritual dimensions, whatever, uh, certainly can see a framework for that. And that makes sense to me too. I'm very open to that possibility. But I'm still puzzled, you know, why? 
it, even with the spiritual or metaphysical aspect, it could be kind of limited, you know. But, but why should any one of us be able to do this? I don't know. And I'm, going to, I'm, going to, I'm writing another book, and, and maybe I'm going to try to answer that to my satisfaction. <laughs> okay, that's about all I want to say. Um, except for one thing, I do seminars. I, I do a, a mix between the conscious state remote viewing style, but from a very basic point of view. Uh, the way that Helen Russ approached remote viewing in the early days. And I also blend that with uh, dream work, because I like to integrate the two modes together. That just happens to be my approach. Some people end up doing great in dreams, and others don't. So they, you choose your, your route. Others don't like dreams, and they, they go to the conscious state. Well, fine, you've got an option. When you attend one of my workshops, you've got an option. I start where you are, not where I tell you you should be. So that's, that's my approach. And I'm doing independent research. I've been associated recently with the Rhine Research Center in Durham, North Carolina, uh, to help develop maybe new approaches for understanding uh, how to um, understand uh, the processing that goes on in the brain a little better. And we'll be probably working with the neuroscientists from the Duke University area. And I've got some ideas to, to follow up on that. I'm a little slow on what I wanted to do on the International Psy Alert Center. I got swamped. I just couldn't handle the emails. I mean, I shut it down for a while. And um, like I said, I'm working on a third book with a precognitive theme and also an integrative theme. Um, because I'm a long-term member of the ASD, I feel this dreams are a neglected second major whatever child that we all, all have. And I hate to see that part of our natural abilities not be given more notice. And so I'm trying to, to bring that up in the ASD, uh, the Association for the Study of Dreams. And I've been giving a number of lectures over the years, uh, bringing Psy into the ASD dream community uh, with a fair degree of success. And I'm working with psychiatrists, psychologists, clinical people, artists, and all that. Uh, but my objective is to get Psy dreams back into this dream community where it should belong, where it belongs in the first place. Well, being a Stargate guy, I would say the exploration continues. Okay. 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 I realize this is a different twist from probably what you were expecting, um, but I have to relate where I've been. This is, this is me, you know. I'm an integrator. I believe in working in both the conscious and the unconscious state. Just me. Any questions? Thank you very much. Very okay. good. It's such a different approach and all that. I've got to tell you, the whole weekend thus far for me has been different. Okay. <laughs> we, we can take question and answers and stuff like that. Okay. However, the taping's off and the formal question and answer, if you'd like to okay. do that, okay. can take place now. Those that wish to break and get ready for okay. the, the stuff. Yeah, books back here. Yeah.